Chuck Billy from Testament. Are you surprised at the resurgence of the movement in recent years? Well, there's always a new generation of young people that want rebellious type of music. And, um, you know, when we had it in the early 80s, end of the ni uh, early 90s, of course, you know, the alternative music and grunge came in and kind of took over what metal had built up as far as getting marketing on radio and MTV and everything. So that bottom kind of fell out of that. And, of course, there's a lot of new bands that were kind of inspired by older styles of thrash and speed metal that uh, came around again and started getting good record deals again and started getting exposure on MTV and radio and and just opened up a big door again, you know, for this style of music and for us to still be around, you know, 20-something years later and have the original guys back in the band, you know, a lot of uh, old school fans came out of the woodwork again to kind of re-experience, you know, what we're re-experiencing with all the original guys as well. That era, low demonic I mean what kind of importance do you place on that uh, well I mean I, I just think that we we've never really been a band to like jump on a bandwagon we always uh, knew what we wanted to do and just did what we wanted and <clears throat> once the original band had split up me and Eric did make it a personal goal that we're gonna even get heavier and harder and that was that was the plan of attack so you know when we did the low record was definitely a lot harder and heavier than the ritual and I even on that record sang a song dog face gods which was even my first attempt at doing like some death metal style vocals and I got a lot of response from people on the internet saying hey man once you ever thought about doing some more songs like that and at that point you know Gene Hoagland came into the picture in the band and the songs we were creating with Gene were a lot harder and faster and heavier and I actually really did try to sing on those that album, but it just what does it didn't feel natural. So I went to the death voice, and Eric and everybody was like, "No, that's what you got to do," you know. So that's what I did. He's a great drummer, and he brought a whole different element to to us at that time. So that that record with what the fans wanted and what just the way it felt, we came out, you know, harder even and heavier. And a lot of people, a lot of our true fans were kind of like, well, what are you guys doing, you know, and didn't understand it, but we knew that our goal was to just keep trying to progress and play harder stuff and be heavier and not not look back, you know, and, uh, you know, from there we did the, the Gathering record, which is even a little more faster, it's a different style, we had Lombardo on it, and Lombardo again inspired Eric for a different style, and really brought the best out of Eric because Eric is really he's really like tried to mold a lot of the drums he has it what he wants in mind but when Lombardo came into the picture he didn't have to mold him he just started playing and Eric had to just jump on and just go and uh and when we were writing that record you know I knew when I just hearing the song I was like man this is some great stuff you guys got left a lot of room for me to do a lot of different stuff and that's probably where me, I it was my favorite record because I really got to show a lot of different voices and dynamics and vocally and do a little bit of everything I've done on it. And that was probably at that point where like we kind of knew we settled into what the band was about and the style we were created for us. And it all kind of came together at that point. Now you've always had a political slant to your lyrics. I don't, I don't like, like preaching and telling people how to live their life and what to do. But, you know, if there's... I, I know, being a young, rebellious kid, that last thing I really cared about was the environment and society. I just wanted to sex, drugs, rock, rock and roll, and party, you know. And that's what you're concerned about, you know. But music always plays a big part in, you know, in your teenage years. And if there's something about the environment that they can kind of catch a message through our songs, and they might go, whoa, you know, I heard I heard about that through a Testament song. Maybe it might open up their eyes to something about the greenhouse effect or, you know, the ice sheets melting and, you know, uh, and just everything, you know, that if they can get a message out, that's cool. But we've never been the band to, like, preach it to everybody and say, this is what we believe in, this is what we want you to believe in. It's just a message, you know, but uh, it's hard to give any advice because 
everybody's going to be their own person and live their own life. What issues in society do you think are you know, most in need of being addressed? Well, definitely just our environment, big time. It's going to take a global movement for everybody to, especially with uh, our temperature and our climates are changing, our seasons are different than we remember them as kids. And it's, it's constantly changing. And by the planet warming up, the ice sheets are melting and the water and the oceans are going to rise again. And there's going to be some of the small islands are going to be gone quick. You know, maybe not in our lifetime, but in my children or grandchildren's lifetime, it probably be, might happen. What are your recollections, if any, of the hardcore scene in the 80s and any kind of influence that it had on Testament, musically or you know, value-wise? Is there any connection? Not really with Testament so much. Not as far as the message, but I think as far as the attitude. Um, hardcore always, always seemed to have an attitude. And I think that's what, like when we were, before Testament, getting into bands, listening to... I guess it was more like punk, I guess, you know, it was like Dead Kennedys and Plasmatics and stuff like that. It was more about the attitude. I don't know, I don't hardcore really, I mean, you know, I guess there's, I don't know, if hardcore or you, that straight edge or whatever. I mean, I think sometimes that's kind of a cool message for younger people. You know, it's, it isn't all about just drugs and partying, that you can still have a good time and listen to good music and enjoy yourself without you know, getting all fucked up and killing somebody or killing yourself. Your older albums are actually, uh, some of them were recently re released by Prosthetic Records. Mm -hmm. How did that reissue deal come about? Um, well, we were on Spitfire Records and we kind of stalled to put a new record out with them for a long time. That's why it took so long to do this record. So we just weren't, weren't happy with the label. We just felt that they weren't doing a good job. Um, weren't promoting the band really just really weren't backing up the band and um, at one point we just found out through the grapevine that they sold the record label they didn't even tell us they just, we found out so we contacted the new label that bought the company and um, asked them what's going on you know with Testament and they said well we're not releasing any new records signing any new bands we're only releasing gospel music like, well, where do we fit in? Like, well, you don't. What do you want? So we want to be off the label. We want to be free from our contract. Sure, no problem. At the end of the day, they had a signed form being released. And we're like, thank, thank you. you know. And then so a couple of days went by. We're like, you know what? We need to write back to them and see if we can get all our records back, too. And so wrote them back, called them up, said, we want our records. Said, sure, no problem. We're not going to do anything with them. So we got all the albums back. Even though we... Because they went out through our label, Burn Offerings, we get, they was licensed to them. But they still had the right to sell and do all that, but they weren't going to do anything with them. So we, next thing you know, we had all our albums back, and, um, and at that point we called all the labels. And we knew we wanted to be on Nuclear Blast, uh, but we got started getting like all these guys bidding on the band, and Nuclear Blast, the first one, stepped up. Best deal on the, on the outdid everybody. Offer couldn't refuse, so we went with them. And uh, and then we're like, well, we got some old records. What do you what do you think about that? And they're like, well, you know, we'll take them and put them out, but we can't give you anything for them. I'm like, well, screw that, you know. <laughs> so at that point, we knew Prosthetic. They approached us and wanted them. So we said, okay, well, if you if you want them and you're going to pay for them, let's go. For, let's make a deal. So we did, and so it was good. They're they're getting them out there. Status of your other band, Dublin Death Patrol. Well, we're just kind of. We really you know, had never had any plans. We all just um, yeah, that thing was all just supposedly supposed to get together just to jam and have fun and, and write some or play some of the old songs that we wrote when we were younger, four or five songs. And we we're like, man, it'd be a shame that nobody's ever going to hear these songs. So we decided to do the record, and that was it. We just decided we're not going to go out and get a record deal. We're just going to sell it through our web you know, through the internet and sell shirts and merch through the internet and if we can get some shows we'll go play and usually we play like a New Year's Eve we get a lot of shows we play New Year's and go over to Europe you know a couple times and we, you know we might someday do another record again and just get together for fun you know when we get a break so it's not the end of it that's for sure